Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, may we join our voices of praise with the choir of your holy apostles, and exalt your blessed Mother Mary on the feast of her Assumption. Through her prayers, make us worthy to rejoice with her at your right hand. When we meet you in glory, and we will raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Son of Justice, who in his grace dawned from Mary, who is the great East, and with his divine rays gave light to the entire world, to the hidden offspring who honored the day of his mother's assumption and exalted her blessed memory on earth and in heaven. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ, the Word of God and Son of the Eternal Father, at the appointed time you chose to take flesh and be born of the Virgin Mary, the daughter of David. And you fulfilled your plan of salvation for us. You lifted up your mother to be with you and crowned her as queen of heaven and of earth. Today we honor the feast of her glorious assumption and with the holy apostles who gathered from around the world to honor her and with those who serve you in heaven, we cry out to her with noble melodies proclaiming, Come in peace, O pure mother, you gave birth to God the Word and carried the heavenly King in your womb. Come in peace, O temple of the Holy Spirit, you are the dwelling place of God the Most High. Come in peace, O spiritual ladder seen by Jacob. Through you we climb to the heights above the power of suffering and death. Now, O Christ our God, we ask you through her prayers and with the fragrance of this incense, to grant forgiveness of sin, security to churches, and peace to monasteries and convents. Help the elderly, encourage youth, nurture the children, and grant rest to the faithful who have gone to you. Make us worthy to be united with your mother, the Holy Virgin Mary, and the choirs of the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors within your eternal kingdom, where we shall raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Sí. Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept the fragrance of this incense, which we have offered on the feast of the Assumption of your Mother, the most blessed Virgin Mary. With the holy apostles, make us worthy to honor the day of her departure from this world and grant forgiveness to your flock that celebrates her feast. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shat Hayalaton O Kali Shat Lama Yoto Host of angels descended, cherubim and seraphim, and they took Mary's body to the paradise of love. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Anticipate one another in showing honor. Do not grow slack in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Endure in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the Holy Ones. Exercise hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. 
Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Alleluia. The King's Lord stands in glory. The Queen is at your right. The praise, glory, and honor of the Most Holy Trinity. From this instance. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen in glory. The evangelist Luke writes, As they continued their journey, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary, who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came up to him and said, Lord, Do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do all the serving? Tell her to help me. And the Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things, but there is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part, and it shall not be taken away from her. This is the truth, peace be with you. Let love be without dissimulation, hating that which is evil and clinging to that which is good. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. So today, let us think about death. It's something in the modern world that they write in terror of and hate and try to cover over. In fact, there doesn't seem to be any more death. We just celebrate life. And it's a misunderstanding of what death is. The first thing to point out is that, of course, death, along with hell, is not part of the origin of creation. They are both results of free choices of human beings. The case of hell also being actually the first result of the fall of the angels. But in the initial creation, everything is in grace. Everything is in union with God. Everything is in the intimacy of friendship with God. You'll see it on occasion in the anaphoras. It will speak about creating all things in grace. Not just the human race, but everything was in proper order. It's what we call the state of original justice. 
Unfortunately, we emphasize original sin so often, we forget what God actually originally intended, which was not death and hell and destruction. And so in this state of original justice, and again, the notion of the word justice is what is justified, what is rectified, what is perfectly in order and in place. And that original creation of original justice does not entail death, which is why in the garden, in the garden or portrayed in the, in the book of Genesis, in the garden you have in the center of this existence, the tree of life. The tree of life is just named in this story of Genesis. It doesn't really become part of the story, except that it's protected later on by a flaming sword and an angel. But now that one ever partakes takes of this, this uh, tree because of the fact of what Adam and Eve wind up choosing subsequently. And the result of that is death. But the original justice, what a person was meant to be, is in creation of being in union with God. And that's why the only time this has been done again is first and foremost by the Blessed Virgin Mary who in her creation is created in grace. That's what we mean by the immaculate conception. The act of creation is without stain. Makula in Latin just means stain. So talk about the immaculate conception means that the moment of her creation is stainless. It's without tarnish. It is the way humanity was originally created. And then, of course, with our Lord's conception, that is a divine act which takes place of the incarnation. In some ways similar, fundamentally and essentially dramatically different. And what was supposed to happen in the original justice, in the original creation, is that an individual who was conceived, born into this world in the state of grace, in friendship with God, in union with God, was meant to continually move in that direction of grace and what is love. It's why the church has chosen this epistle of St. Paul, the letter to the Romans. Chapters 12 through chapter 15 is about morals, how we act. But how we act is not a checklist of do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this, do this, do this, and especially don't do that. That is not morality. That is, I don't know what it is. It's a technician's manual for fixing your motorcycle. It's not what God created. God created intimacy, friendship, and love. And that union is meant to be from which our actions flow. Not a checklist of what you do and don't do. No one ever came up to you. We'll use another image. When you fell in love, and certainly almost all of you have, and if you haven't yet, uh, just wait, it'll be one of the nuttiest parts of your existence. But no one ever told you what you're supposed to do to fall in love or what you're supposed to do in love. You just knew that you were smitten. You walk around kind of dim-witted for a bit of time. Unfortunately, we all come back down to earth with our feet on the ground. But we know either ourselves or people that we've worked with, we know that they get a little nutty during those periods. Or how many have had the grandmother who all of a sudden at 75, huh, meets somebody in her widowhood and she's like, oh, this isn't supposed to happen to me. This is only when you're a teenager. And everyone smiles and they think it's sweet. Because we are drawn to what is good. And when we see good, we are drawn to it and we act accordingly. That is why St. Paul is reminding those who are fallen and born into a, a state of original sin, love what is good. Cling to that which, hate what is evil, and cling to that which is good. So that what's supposed to happen in original justice is the individual continually through their whole life was meant to go from goodness to better, from goodness to better, and the constant movement towards ultimately the infinite good, which is God. And at some point where in God's providence they had arrived at the point of the fullness of the love that they could possibly express on this earth, they would be transfigured and assumed into heaven. That is the original plan for everyone. For you, for me, that was what it was supposed to be. A creation in intimate love and friendship, a life filled with charity and friendship, and a transfiguration in glory in the end to enter into divinity. That's not how we die now, is it? The assumption is part of the restoration of God's original plan. 
It is all about love, it is all about friendship, and it is about a transfiguration that takes place at the end of a life and an entrance into divine existence of God. That is the assumption. It's always kind of amusing. We wind up talking to some of the Protestants and they just do not understand the assumption. Oh, you make Mary into a goddess. It's like, no. Mary just happens to be the first creature of the human race to receive the gift that we are all meant to receive on the day of the resurrection. The only thing that is different is God did not allow her body to corrupt in the grave or be burned by her nieces and nephews. She is the first fruits and the promise of what is held out to all of us being baptized. That's a big difference. And so, of course, the principle underlying all of this is that when we love, when we see something good, we are drawn towards it. It's why in meeting a person, you meet someone, you might have bumped into them somewhere, maybe at work, and you have a small little exchange, and you're like, this person's kind of interesting. So then, the next week when you see them, you look for them in the cafeteria. Yeah, is this place empty? And you begin to communicate because something you perceived of being good, which is why we call it being attractive, it draws us, goodness draws us. When you read the lives of the saints, people are drawn to the saints because they are reflections of the divine goodness. It's very simple. And even all of creation reflects God in some way, even sin. Sin has something in it which is attractive. Sin is not pure darkness. Sin is something which has an attraction in it, but which is objectively disproportionately bad. And so that, it's one of the reasons why, for those who have seen the film Gibson made on the Passion of the Christ, it's why when they made the film, the devil, of course, is played by an actress. It's a woman playing it. But they have her head shaved. She's obviously the devil, but at the same time, she's not repulsive, though she's, there's a draw, but at the same time, the ambiguity, which is the ambiguity of all sin. We wouldn't sin if we didn't see something that was attractive in it. This is the perversion and the difficulty we have with sin. Even the person committing suicide is not choosing death. They're choosing escape from whatever the overwhelming pain is in their life. But the problem why these things are sinful is because that little good that we're attracted to, the rest of it is disproportionately wrong action. And so yes, there's something attractive in it, but the rest of it is makes the whole action bad. It's an important principle to understand when you discern morally. And so the principle that underlies this whole idea is that love places the lover, the one who loves, the one who is attracted at the same level as the beloved. So the person who chooses and who loves something which is good and is above us, which is virtuous and ultimately God, that always ennobles and elevates the person. When we love things that are beneath us, the fourth piece of cake, the excessive conversation which degenerates into gossip because now it's just idle talk and chatter, it degrades us. It pulls us down to what we have chosen to do, which is to spend the hour and a half on the phone talking about nothing and damaging many. That's what pulls us down. Love draws us out of ourselves. When you understand something, you draw it into your knowledge. It becomes part of your mind. But love draws us out to the thing that we are seeking, which is why love always moves towards union. Knowledge always winds up being something that I bring in. And because of these two aspects, you have the distinction between original justice and original sin. Whether I choose myself first and foremost and then try to work other things into it in a sinful manner, or whether I am drawn to the higher good outwardly. So death only becomes part of humanity's existence because they choose otherwise than to love. They reject love. 
We have entire corpus of literature on unrequited love. We have all these different things. Humanity understands the depth of it. We just don't seem to be able to apply it to our life relative to the Creator. This is the mystery behind death then. Death is meant to be transformed, which is why in our tradition, and especially in the Eastern tradition, we talk about death as a repose, which is why you'll see in the bulletins, I'll use both words, assumption, dormition. Dormition is the act of falling asleep, like in this heat. Dormire in Latin means to sleep, to fall asleep. Dormitio is the action of falling asleep. Kaisis, this falling asleep. But that is the stage of Mary coming to the end of her life of the fulfillment of the terrestrial possibilities of love, that in entering into movement from this world of death, and it's never among the writers, they don't certify that for sure she died. She very well may have gone into her dormition and then been transfigured and assumed into heaven. That's why Pius XII, when he defines the assumption in 1950, doesn't say whether she died or not. Because the tradition of the apostolic faith is not clear. And she very well may have followed the same footsteps as was meant to originally been created for Adam and Eve. But be that as it may, it is about a transfiguration of love. Which is why I just leave you. We mentioned this will be the last week we talk about the spiritual life. Next week we start St. Ephraim. The end of our spiritual life, my life, your life, all of the baptized, is meant to be arriving at that transfiguring love and that transfiguring union. We are supposed to arrive. We've talked about the stages of the beginners. We've talked about the proficients. We've talked about infused contemplation. We've talked about the dark nights that burn us by the development of the faith and charity. But we are meant to arrive, each of us, in our lives at some point, and not that it takes forever, it depends upon the individual. We are meant to arrive at the point where memory, intellect, and will are all absorbed into God. So that there is a stabilization of the individual by grace to move towards that path of divine union because that inflowing of God that was given to creation and to Adam and Eve at the very beginning is meant to be restored by faith and baptism. The sad part is, is that many of us don't get anywhere close to that when we do not learn how to love. Falling down and being smitten and having raging hormones, that's not our doing, that's nature. Deer do that, we call it the rut. It's so why you go hunting, they're distracted. There's nothing necessarily virtuous in it. But charity, that only comes with freedom. To love what is good, to hate what is evil, to cling, to adhere to what is good, that requires healing and it requires grace. And the goal that we move toward is that ultimately the mind and the will, the memory, are all assumed into that divine light because we love. It is not done to us. It is offered to us as charity. When we respond to that goodness and that love and God can draw us forward, the ultimate goal is to bring that individual into the divinity. And so that presence of placing the lover to the level of the beloved is what we call the state of union. And for theologians, to give you an idea where it should be in our lives, Gary Goulagrange, the great Dominican theologian in the 20th century, he says that all the bishops for sure should be in the state of union when they're consecrated. God will judge whether they are there or not. But it is an understanding of our movement from beginning to proficiency to union, to enter into the state where the divine inflowing prepares us by this absorption and elevation of the mind and the will and the imagination to receive permanently, not just in fleeting moments. Even a beginner can have one of those moments of a great sigh 
of grace coming in, and for an instant, they're touched by that divine union to encourage them to keep going. This state is permanent. This is meant to be a point where this individual, by having the elevation of the mind and the will and the memory into God, gives them the possibility of a permanent reception of what we call divine espousals. Just the way it sounds, the divine marriage, the transfiguration of the individual in union with God. It's why if you, in the Old Testament, there is an entire book called the Song of Songs, the Canticle of Canticles. It is about a marriage. It is about people being smitten by love. It is, why is it there in scripture? Because ultimately, it is in the old covenant meant to be that union between God and Israel, and in the new between God and the church, and even further of the individual who finds that divine goodness, who is elevated and ravaged by that divine love. And the spiritual writers don't hesitate in using that terminology of being ravaged by divine love. The excitement of the wedding night, the excitement of the wedding, not these days, because everyone pre-fornicates before and practices, but in the day when marriage was the moment that you entered into union, the excitement, the anticipation, not just because it's something physical that's going to happen, because it is the melding of two individuals in love together, permanently. This is the divine state that each one of us, every single one of you is called to, to this transforming love in our lives. And that's why we call the union, this divine union is called espousals. It is the preparation for the ultimate divine union itself. So that when we repose, death. When we fall asleep ourselves, dormition, at the end of the days when this body no longer keeps us going, that soul is meant to be taking the rest of us because that personal union has been present in the transforming union. It's why we call it ecstasy. Now, ecstasy these days sometimes means drugs, sometimes it means a lot of things, sometimes it just means sex. That is not ecstasy. I was once flying back and forth between the States and back, I was studying in Europe. And wound up being on an airplane, where in those days when they used to still have empty seats in the planes, this young man came up, I was probably only 23. And this young man came up to me, and he says, do you mind if I sit here? I was like, no, it's fine. Which usually says, we are now going to be bombarded with questions for the next six hours of the flight. And that's okay. I, don't, I put all my books away and we just do whatever his questions are going to be. That's how I was introduced to the chemical ecstasy back in the 80s. Not introduced personally. Introduced the concept. All right. Because he was from California and he was going to go on vacation in Antwerp and Copenhagen, which in the 80s, you know exactly why he's going to Antwerp and Copenhagen. But that's all right, the poor kid from California was lost. So this was an apostolic moment of evangelization. We were the same age. I think he was intrigued that I was the same age, but we, we were both living on totally different planets as far as our conversation went on. And so when I say he introduced me to ecstasy, he started talking about, oh, he's gonna to go to Antwerp and he's gonna find this and he's gonna find that and this is gonna be great and this is gonna be great you know, in Antwerp. And he started talking about this drug that he takes and they all sit around in hot tubs in California and all feel good about each other and how much it makes me love these other people. And he realizes in the conversation, this doesn't really, he, I'm not as excited as this kid is. And so he's intrigued by that. And so when he asked about it, I said, well, I certainly don't consider a friendship to be present if I have to ingest chemicals to feel good about this other person. How can you call that friendship when I need that chemical crutch? Oh no, but it feels really great, etc." And it's absolutely true. It was true 35 years ago and it is true today. If I need a technique or a chemical to feel good or to be ecstatic, something's wrong. 
That is not what we were created for. That is not how we were created. God created us for ecstasy, but not for chemical transformations of your cerebrum. Ecstasy, the word itself, literally means to stand outside of yourself. Stasis ex, to be drawn outside of ourselves. That's why we use the word ecstasy of the marital union. Because the two become one flesh, that transformation. And that is what is meant to take place at the end of our days. Well, it's meant to take place much earlier. St. Catherine of Siena went through this mystical espousals at the age of 18. All right, there's your challenge. Her first vision, of course, when she was five. But over the front, she had the whole transfiguring divine espousals at 18. Of course, she was dead at 33, so it made for a short life, but... So it's not a question about age. St. Teresa of Lisieux died at 24, a great mystic. So what are we waiting for? What has to happen in my life before I finally realize that I was created for and from infinite love? What am I waiting for in my life before it becomes something serious that the pursuit of human life, the essence of human life is meant to seek charity, to seek love, or as St. Paul says, love what is good, hate what is evil, adhere to what is good. That is the whole essence of our purpose of our existence, to find what is good, to create what is good, to love what is good, to hate what is evil, and to be open to the illusions of the things that make us sin over and over and over again. St. Peter uses the very graphic but unpleasant image of the dog returning to its vomit. We've known that disgusting moment in our lives because most of us had puppies. St. Paul uses as the image of sin. We keep going back to the things that we vomit up, we get rid of, and we return to. What is necessary within my individual life to get me understanding the assumption the transformation in divine charity. Because we are meant to come to the end of our days, in dotage or not in dotage, and step through that dormition into the entire embrace of divinity. It's what we were created for, it is what we are meant for, it is what we were restored in through baptism and the faith. And I leave you with one line from Saint John in his first epistle. When we arrive at this complete forgetfulness plunged into charity and our entire seeking is God, we pass through the veil of death and St. John says that we shall be like him. We shall be transfigured as God is God because we shall see him as he is. That seeing begins now by grace. That is the unfolding of the faith that we've talked about over these last three weeks. Let us ask for God to blind us by the brilliance of grace and light within our lives so that we no longer wait for something to happen, but allow God to draw us by his love into the eternal embrace for which we were created. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Telot ma deb hei da lo po, bal mo da lo po dam khali ta yut. Wei nem su go tai bu ta o ke u dal bai ta wes bu dam hai ek lo ko de sho. the special hymn for the transfer, for the Feast of Our Lady. Mighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. We remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us. We recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary and Saint Jude and Saint Rock. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. 
Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. of St. John Chrysostom on page 876, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin. You are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people and through your Holy Spirit now and forever. by all angels bless you humanity exalts you and all creation glorifies you look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever Father, in the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, 
be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our things. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming. exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only son, son. Vadiano haudakam hashoni lema ben haye Ansabe lahmamida kori shoto ubara hukadesh Waksuya biltalmida kara mara Saba hula mehne kulhu Hono denita Fahuru Dachlofaikun, Wachlof Sagie, Metapaseo, Meti Hammer, Hosoyon, how may we hoid an alam alamin? O Kano Alcosa, Domsik woman, Hamro, who men my Barahu Kodesh, Uyabil Talmida Koromara, Sadesh Tawam Mehne Kulhu, Kono Denita, Demo Dila Diatiki Hodato, Dahlo Faikun, Wahlov Sagi, Ete Shadu Meti Hev. Hosoyon, how may we hide on Alam Alamin? Do this in memory of me each time you eat this bread and drink this cup. You remember my death until I come again. God who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, 
who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your holy altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, where the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, manin morio, nite moro rojo chayu kadisho, onachen alainu ar korbono hono. Spread the body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, Grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and in security. We offer for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priest, the Chaste Deacons, the pure Subdeacons, and all the orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, 
be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your holy church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and, a religi and religious life in a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor. May those who you call to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will. That in all and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, it is now, and shall be forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O oh Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our God may be sanctified by your holy blood, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for a new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory. Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
O oh Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. You are blessed in your kingdom is holy, and we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. O oh God the Father, we bow before you when we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the radiant cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom we glory forever. <laughs>